Hi, I'm Ricky Alexander. Welcome to the back porch. Hey, and I'm Sweet Meg. Today we have John Eric Kelso with us, which is fantastic. The amazing, the John amazing, Eric wonderful. Um, and what's really wonderful about him is that he's been in the scene for a while. He's been playing this music for a long time. He's a very deep musician when it comes to like early jazz stuff. Um, I'd say one of the deeper ones in this scene completely. I don't know. I feel like you're one of the dudes. <laughs> um, so I guess what we want to start with is like. You've been doing this. You said you've gotten into this in elementary school. That's in, and in Detroit, right? Yeah. Um, can you tell us something about that? Sure. I, I grew up near Detroit in a city called Allen Park, Michigan. And when I was 10, it was time to decide whether you wanted to be in the school band. And I, I wanted to play the trumpet and then found out that my dad had played the trumpet. I didn't know that. And uh, he said, well, I, let me see if I can find my old horn. And uh, so he was my first teacher and he he was born in 1923, so he grew up with the swing era, and, uh, and he still had a bunch of his old 78 RPM records from that era. So I kind of I got into the trumpet and that music at the same time at age 10. I was a weird little kid, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I, I found a friend that was similarly into that kind of stuff and was a musician. And we, we used to ride our bikes around to antique stores to find more 78s. Wow. You know? And then we, we actually put together a band while still in elementary school. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it, it was, and the first band we put together was a big band. Oh my gosh. And, uh, I love to see And we that. started experimenting with improvising even then, you know. And so that was really fun. And then we sort of figured out that it was easier to have just a small, like, Dixieland or trad jazz uh, band because we had enough players that were improvising, you know, relatively well. <laughs> To, to do that. We, ha we got this summer job for two summers when I was in junior high, uh, playing six days a week, five hours a day at Greenfield Village, which is part of the Henry Ford Museum Whoa. in wow. Dearborn, Michigan. And so my friend was just kind of ballsy and he, he just, he called them up and said, you know that little park you have and you have that little boat that goes by in the water there and there's a gazebo you know, yeah, you need to have a, an early jazz band playing there, and I've got one. You know, and this, this, we're talking, we're, wow, you know, hustling gigs in middle, sixth grade. Middle, middle, oh my god, middle school kids, you know, and Jeez. so even though we were junior high kids, we had to have subs sometimes. So we would hire like professional Detroit musicians wow. to be our subs, and so then they'd come in and also, like take us under their wing and give us guidance and stuff like that. I so. bet the musicians like loved that. I can't imagine like, can you imagine now like being called by like someone <laughs> in seventh grade, like, hey dude, can you like pick up my gig this Saturday? Well, <laughs> some of them you know, thought it was a joke when they got the call, and, you know, but then like, but the word kind of spread quickly yeah, too, I because bet. it's, you know, traditional jazz is a small world period, but, yeah. but in a, you know, in an area like Detroit, it's, it was like the small, tightly knit community. And then they started getting, you know, inviting us to their gigs and we'd go and listen to people playing and, you know, in places we weren't old enough to be in. And, you know, <laughs> we would like, you know, wear like sweaters with a tie and, and like try to look older, you know, and try to try to get served at like age 15, you know. <laughs> So 
shall you reap, dear? And what you reap is gonna make you weep someday, sweetheart. I love that players like you guys who clearly know the old stuff, but also can clearly do the modern stuff and care about it and like the modern stuff and what you guys play. I love it because it's like, it is still the forms and these old songs, but there is, it's like, to me, I feel like there's context of what's happened since then, but it's not like, because like one thing I don't enjoy often is if you get like a super modern player just like blowing bebop over a super chatty song, like it just feels weird. It's like a, it's, I don't know, it's friction. Right. Is that something you've thought about or is it something that naturally progressed from just playing so long with the same cats or from playing with all different cats or? Yeah, that is something that I, I kind of, I guess I'm proud of that we found our way of doing that without making a thing of it. You yeah. Know? And um, a lot of it with the, at the ear in, uh, I'll blame Scott Robinson. No, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm inspired 
by playing with Scott Robinson because he has this way of encompassing the history of jazz and everything that he plays without it seeming like I'm going to now play every style in one solo or all at once. You know, it's not like a parlor trick. It's just that he loves all this music. And depending on who you're playing with and like different combinations that we have there, we just kind of find our common ground and then just feel it out as far as like, which way does it want to stretch in this way? Or is, you know, like some groups feel a little more elastic that way. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes we'll have a guitar player that's maybe, you know, not as much into the older style of comping so that it suggests something else. And so just like, if it feels right, we'll, we'll just go there, you know, yeah. without trying to force a round peg in a square hole. But like, I think he and I both enjoy those kind of loose, but informed settings, you know, yeah. as far as playing with guys who, who respect the music, but, and then can just be in the moment and take it where it feels like it wants to go, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think I was also inspired in that way by uh, Ruby Braff, who was one of my heroes, mm -hmm. who I, well, as I mentioned, one of the guys I got to know moving to New York, and he even had me play on a few of his albums, which was, cool. again, mind blown. It was just like, you know, um, unbelievable for me, like, uh, and, uh, but, you know, he's one of these guys that even starting in the 50s when he started to become known, uh, found ways of, of playing traditional jazz and swing, but like just always really being in the moment and being super creative and, and tuned into the players he was with and really having great, you know, interaction in the moment. And uh, he always had this kind of like, the sound of surprise, as uh, mm. Whitney Ballier would say, you know, he was this great writer who coined that phrase, but it's like, it really fits because it's like, he, he just, he's always got something to surprise you, whether it's just that it's maybe not so traditional what he's playing or just that he's just so open-minded that he's just, he's going for melody and, and, and whatever that is that he's hearing, he'll just go for it. It doesn't have to be like, did, yeah, but did, uh, you know, Kid Ori play that? Or did, you know, did, did uh, Jumbo yeah. Smith play that phrase? <laughs> you know.